there's a famous Hasidic folktale about a man known for spreading gossip in his village. Upon realizing the error of his ways, he approaches the town rabbi to beg forgiveness. The rabbi instructs him to take a feather pillow, cut it up, and scatter its contents to the wind. Delighted to be forgiven for performing such an easy task, the man quickly complies, and upon returning to the rabbi, asks, Am I now forgiven? Just one more small, insignificant thing, the rabbi replies. You need to go and retrieve every last feather. But that's impossible, says the man, exasperated. Correct, replies the rabbi. And though you earnestly wish to correct the evil you have wrought through your words, it would be far simpler to retrieve every last feather from that pillow. This simple yet illustrative tale speaks to the wide-ranging powers of our words, a power we innately understand yet so often overlook. This past week, we celebrated Juneteenth National Independence Day in commemoration of the Emancipation Proclamation's publication throughout Texas, the last Confederate state to accept the law. But June 19th wasn't the day that every last slave in Texas went free. It was the day that the order was first posted in writing in Galveston. Similarly, on July 4th, we'll celebrate another Independence Day. But July 4th wasn't the day the colonies won their independence from Britain. It was the day that the members of our Continental Congress declared it. Our words shape reality, giving us beauty and insight, knowledge and skills, ideas and philosophies. Words gave us our tradition and its teachings. Words gave us the very infrastructure of our civilization, from cities and states to schools, businesses and communities, to computers and the internet, just as words gave us the freedoms we enjoy each and every day. But even as our words possess the power to create and to ennoble, so too, as this story teaches, do they have the power to destroy as the man who sought forgiveness so earnestly from the rabbi soon discovered. He couldn't repair every reputation he had damaged. He couldn't undo every ounce of shame he had brought. Nor could he erase the malicious example he set for others through his thoughtless gossip. This is precisely why our tradition urges us to guard our words zealously and with care. As the prophet Jeremiah warns, our tongues are deadly arrows whose words once launched in thoughtlessness or in treachery can only cause harm. Our tra tradition holds such disdain for thoughtless speech that it has a special name for it, Lashon Hara, the evil tongue. But Lashon Hara includes far more than simple gossip. It includes any statement, spoken or written or gestured, that could potentially embarrass, insult, imperil, or mislead another. From gossip to slander, to derogatory nicknames, to insincere complaints, to haggling with a business owner over an article we don't mean to buy. It doesn't matter if it's true or false. It doesn't matter if it's a comment or a group text or an Instagram post, if it misleads someone intentionally or not, if it causes human suffering intentionally or not. Then we have spoken Lashon Hara. We have unleashed the evil tongue upon our world. 
And yet, we do it so casually and so often. Sometimes we do it because we're afraid. Sometimes we do it because we're hurt. Sometimes we do it because we just want to exploit someone else for our own benefit, whether commercial or interpersonal, or even to build up our own sense of self-confidence. For me, it was Yelp reviews. Years ago, when my wife and I traveled somewhere warm, we'd typically spend a little time relaxing by the beach or by the pool. But I don't know how to relax. So I'd take out her phone, and I'd write reviews on the places we stayed at or the restaurants we enjoyed. Often, the reviews were superlative. But if we had a less than stellar experience, well, let's just say that neither my wife nor I knew just how viciously snarky I could get. I'm not sure why I took the time to write such scathing reviews. Upon reflection, I can only imagine what it feels like to read merciless appraisals of your livelihood in writing. Wait, I don't have to imagine that. I'm a rabbi. <laughs> but I remain grateful that only a few people read, read these scathing reviews before I recognized them for what they truly were, evidence of my own inability to guard against the seductive siren of Lashon Hara. This week's Parsha Baha'alotcha ends with perhaps the most infamous case of Lashon Hara found within our tradition, when Moses and Moses' siblings, Miriam and Aaron, privately disparage their brother Miriam and Moses criticized Moses. Oh, my apologies. Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses over the fact that the woman he married was a Cushite, a woman of color. They then proceeded to question his authority observing that God has spoken through them as well, conveying their resentment towards Moses' privileged position among the people Israel. God quickly calls the two siblings to account, revealing their salacious discussion to Moses and afflicting Miriam with leprosy, illustrating two sobering aspects of our relationship with Lashon Hara. First, our tradition categorically disapproves of Lashon Hara in any and all circumstances. What Miriam and Aaron said was true. He did marry a woman of color. It's still Lashon Hara. What Miriam and Aaron said was private. They were only talking to each other. It's still Lashon Hara. When we gossip, when we speculate, when we mislead, when we publicly criticize or condemn, when we embarrass. It can be a whisper between friends. It's still Lashon Hara. It can be a post to our school or camp WhatsApp group. It's still Lashon Hara. Or it can be a Yelp review. It's still Lashon Hara. Second, the allure of Lashon Hara may affect any of us. Even Aaron and Miriam, leaders of our people, models of virtue for three millennia, once beset by jealousy, quickly turn their tongues to vilifying their own brother. So how can we hope to succeed where they failed? How can we possibly hope to avoid succumbing to Lashon Hara when even the greatest figures from our tradition do so? For inspiration, we can turn to the psalmist who writes, Mi ha'ish hechafetz chayim, 
אוהב ימים לראות טוב, נצור לשון חמרה, ושפתיך נדבר מרמה. Who delights in life, who craves to see their days filled with goodness? You who guard your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking deceit. The way to keep Lashon Hara at bay, according to our tradition, is through the constant vigilance of a sentinel. Like a sergeant at arms, we must treat our words like weapons to be retrieved with care, used with scrutiny, and returned to their lockbox immediately thereafter, ever mindful of the dangers they pose to us and to the world. This week and two weeks hence, we celebrate our nation's independence. We revel in our freedoms. But our tradition reminds us that just because we're blessed to live in a country in which we are free to say whatever we want doesn't mean that we should say whatever we want. Rather, we must guard our tongues from evil our fingers from typing or texting deceit. In so doing, may we too become the Chafetz Chaim, those who delight in life and live to see their days filled with goodness. Shabbat Shalom.